Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Rebuilding Better, New Materials and Systems for Resource-Efficient SMEs. I'm Hannes McNulty, and as Senior Green Industry Advisor, I lead GGKP's Green Industry Platform, which was launched in 2019. We're very happy to have you with us here today, and of course, we do hope that you are healthy and safe. This is actually the second webinar in a series focused on Rebuilding Better, where experts will discuss themes ranging from sand governance to green bonds to the role of training and academia in building back better. Now, in addition to this ongoing Rebuilding Better webinar series, we have another webinar, Measuring Nature's Contribution, How Natural Capital Will Transform the Economic Recovery, which will take place the same time next week. This webinar will explore some of the latest methods for assessing natural capital in, na in national policies aimed at achieving sustainable development in the post-COVID recovery. It will also include expert discussion on state-of-the-art approaches, including the launch of the recent work by the GGKP expert group on natural capital. You can register for this natural capital webinar on ggkp.org forward slash webinar. Now, if you're not already familiar with the GGKP, I do encourage you to also visit our web platforms and enjoy and join the growing community at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. Now, for today's particular webinar, we're very fortunate to be joined by experts from the Fraunhofer Institute for Manufacturing Technology and Advanced Materials, SEED, Footprints Africa, the Lords Foundation, the UN Environment Program and the VDI Center for Resource Efficiency to discuss the latest innovations in sustainable materials and digitalization strategies for small and medium-sized enterprises. I'd like to point out that we really welcome your comments and questions through the questions box that you see on your screen. And uh, I'd encourage you to actively submit these as ultimately it's a fantastic opportunity to engage directly with the panel of experts and pose your own questions. Um, in addition, after the webinar, we'd also appreciate it if you could just take a few minutes to complete uh, our short survey. Uh, at the end of the day, it's feedback like yours that really does help us shape uh, future webinars. Please also note that a full recording of the webinar will be available on our website at ggkp.org. Now, just before we get started, I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce you to the Global Opportunities for Sustainable Development Goals, or Go for SDGs initiative, which was launched by the UN Environment Programme and Partners in 2019. Go for SDGs will share innovative practices for greener economies and sustainable production and consumption that can be taken to scale. Importantly, Go for SDGs also offers access to a range of tools and services offered by Go for SDGs partners through a recently launched menu of services. For example, the Go for SDGs offer training and capacity building for policymakers. This includes the Technology Needs Assessments Project. Through this project, the UN Environment Programme, in partnership with the Technical University of Denmark, helps developing countries determine their technology priorities for mitigating and adapting to climate change. Go for SDGs also offer knowledge-based tools for greener businesses, such as the One Planet Network's Product Sustainability Information Hub, which provides consumer information for sustainable consumption and guidelines for providing product sustainability information. In addition to training and capacity building development for policymakers, Go for SDGs also offers similar resources for SMEs. This includes UNCC's five-week online circular economy training and the ILO Start and Improve Your Business Training Program. So, coming back to today's webinar, and really without much further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Martin Vogt, Managing Director of the VDI Center for Resource Efficiency. Martin has studied physics at the Humboldt University in Berlin and received his doctorate from the University of Cambridge. Then following a, a postdoc at Harvard University, he worked as a technology consultant at VDI Technology Center, where he coordinated the nanotechnology contact point of the German federal government for the EU Research Framework Program. Martin has now been in his current role as managing director of the VDI Center for Resource Efficiency since 2013. So Martin, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and hereby turn it over to you. 
Yes, hello. Thank you very much, Hannes. Um, hello, I hope everybody can hear me and, and see me. It's always very interesting uh, to, to be online and to um, take uh, participate in this kind of meeting. Since March, uh, we have all learned working with each, uh, digital platforms and uh, it's a very um, challenging but also very interesting experience. Um, I am the manager director of the VDI Center for Resource Efficiency, which is the competence center for um, the German government. We work on behalf of the Federal Ministry for the Environment, and our focus is on developing tools, information services, and also qualification schemes for especially uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. VDI is the German Association of Engineers with over 130,000 members. So we have a very strong network all across the industrial sectors. Our focus is mainly on the technological aspects of um, a resource efficiency. So we really go deep into the um, technical uh, details. We have a lot of technical expertise across um, all the technological and industrial fields. But we also focus more and more on broader schemes we are discussing today, for example, digitalization or product design. Um, if you're interested in our work, you can go to our website, which is uh, shown below on the on the slide. Um, and we have learned over the last 10 years since we exist about the challenges to um, convince small and medium sized enterprises to do um, uh, the work they need to do in order to become more resource efficient. Um, so we focus on uh, the economic aspects. We make the case that they can save money. We can make the case that they become can become more competitive, um, but also that, of course, become greener and more sustainable is the right way forward, not just for their marketing strategy, but also um, as a general um, uh, service to society. Um, and since uh, we started these activities, we have seen a grown um, interest in this in this area. Um, we, uh, with the discussion on, on climate change, um, uh, the um, awareness of environmental issues has become larger and larger and more and more companies come on board to help and support us in our work. So, um, so I'm very happy and delighted that we can today um, make the case globally and discuss with very interesting people about the global challenges we face, uh, not just here in Europe, but worldwide. And that we can also in Europe and here in Germany learn a lot from, from other experiences and, and the challenges which we face in other parts of the world. So um, let me first introduce you to our panel, which uh, I'm very happy today to, um, to host. We first have uh, Yus Akenji in alphabetical order. He's the executive director of the uh, SEED initiative, which supports innovative startups to scale up, to help economies sustainably manage natural resources and enhance ecosystems and reduce poverty. Welcome, Yus. The second uh, uh, panelist is Joanna Bingham. She is the CEO of Footprints Africa, which supports SMEs to adopt future-friendly practices address the challenges of growth and create jobs using supply chains as a tool for development. So um, she works with uh, specifically SMEs in, in Africa. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Katarina Koshek. Um, she comes from the engineering materials side. She is the head of polymeric materials and mechanical engineering at Fraunhofer, which is sort of um, non-university uh, based but but very famous um, uh, research institution working mainly with industry on on direct applications uh, industrial applications so we are quite happy to have her here and she uh, focuses on adhesive technology surfaces shaping and functional materials so she really comes from from the material sciences and can tell us a lot about the potentials for materials in uh, resource efficiency uh, the next panelist is Bettina Heller. She is the Associate Program Officer at the United Nations Environments Program, UNEP. Uh, she works there at the uh, Production and Consumption Unit, uh, which aims to have governments, businesses, and civil society um, to be more resource efficient. Their motto is do more with less and help developing countries leapfrog into new green industries. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have uh, on the panel Lakshmi Poti, who is the senior program manager at uh, materials at the Lords Foundation, 
which challenges and inspires industry to harness its power for good and catalyzes systems change in specific industries with philanthropic capital expertise and connections. And she told me before that the, one of her main focuses is also the textile industry. So she will um, give us uh, some input from, from this area as well. So welcome to all panelists. I'm very happy you are here uh, today. And let me start off with a more general question. Uh, to warm you all up, uh, a lightning round, how they call it in English. Um, and I would like to ask you, starting uh, just briefly, um, what does innovation mean to you? So innovation is a broad term. Many people use it in many different ways. And so I think it's quite interesting to learn from you what is innovation from your point of view, what is important innovation, um, and uh, how you would define this uh, interesting term. So let me start off with Lewis. Uh, thank you so much, Martin, and, and uh, hello everybody, and thank you for participating in this webinar here today. And of course, thank you to the GGKP for the invitation to see. We are, we are also very proud partners of the Go for SDGs that has just been introduced. And you, most of what I'll be talking about here today you should know that you can also find it by uh, directly going through the Go for SDGs platform or for contacting us at SEED. I would like to bring an, an angle of innovation that is not usually touched upon very often because quite often when we talk about innovation, we're talking about uh, people immediately interpret some form of high tech or looking at very complicated materials that service large uh, technological industries or uh, engineering firms. But I, I, I would like to bring a different perspective, including a perspective from which SEED works. And this is looking at um, how micro enterprises especially engage in, in, uh, in innovation because they do not typically have laboratories where they can experiment on different types of material or on high tech. So you see a lot of bottom up innovation and uh, imaginative adaptation to circumstances around them to solving issues that they find or to creating new markets where there are none. And so typically you would see innovation in the form of uh, revising or revisiting old practices and, and renewing them or looking at traditional practices such as a uh, very basic one using leaves for packaging or in a sense adapting by repurposing sort of existing materials that are common around us such as uh, waste and uh, using it for as a resource or for uh, fertilizers and and uh, this gets interpreted in various forms but you see innovation in, in terms of uh, uh, resource recovery product life extension sharing platforms and what is commonly known as uh, servicizing seed works uh, typically with eco inclusive small and medium-sized enterprises these are those that are looking for solutions not just in creating profits but also in solving local problems such as uh, uh, waste reduction, uh, poverty, health issues, and so on. And quite often, you would find that these are not typically the most high-tech companies, but these are also the most effective and resilient ones at solving problems at very local level and in getting very creative in the solutions that they bring, in the innovative solutions that they bring to the table. I'll be elabor elaborating a little bit more on that through this, uh, throughout the session. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Joanna, what does innovation mean to you in the framework of your work? Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I was delighted when I heard this question because I did a postgrad on circular economy and I wrote a dissertation on innovation. So I've got 2000 words to share with you on this topic, which I'm not going to do. Um, so, the, but really, what does it mean for me? I think a, a very similar to, to Lewis's point. The first thing I want to do is I actually wrote down the definition of technology. So the definition of technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. So it doesn't necessarily mean some kind of fancy digital thing. It can be a shovel where you're using your scientific knowledge about how you use weight distribution to help you do a task. So from my mind, technology is the, is the what and innovation is the how. How are you now using that? So you can use a shovel to dig a hole, but you can also use it to, um, you know, to, to make a shelf on your wall. So that's to me what innovation is. It's the how of how you're using your technology. Oh, and one thing I should just also mention, apologies, in the introduction, I'm also representing <clears throat> the African Circular Economy Network right now. Um, I um, This is a network of circular economy practitioners from across the continent. 
and I lead the Ghana chapter. So I just want to make sure they, they get their plug too. Thank you very much for um, adding this uh, to your already impressive um, role. Um, yeah, Bettina, I'll come to you now, to UNEP. I mean, you have probably uh, the innovation, uh, the term innovation um, also means a specific meaning in your frame of work. So my question to you is, what does innovation mean to you? Thanks, Martin, and hi, everybody. Great to speak to you um, today. Um, so perhaps also for background, um, at UNEP, um, we are um, also working very much um, with SMEs, um, small and medium-sized enterprises in all regions, and I can only echo also what Lewis has been saying. Um, and we actually um, implement an approach that we call eco-innovation. <laughs> so it goes along already um, the lines of innovation, obviously, and uh, where we work with small and medium-sized enterprises to help them to um, mainstream sustainability into their entire business strategy and model and um, therefore my understanding of innovation comes very much from that angle and what I would like to stress is that for me it um, means also going beyond incremental changes to really systemic and transformative solutions um, so that again doesn't have to mean that it's very complex or it necessarily needs a new technology it could be something that's already been there and it's just being used in a different way but i think from the mindset with which we should approach innovation we should always think about um, having the entire value chain in, in mind and thinking about um, where can we make um, the biggest changes um, and where can we make the, the biggest also um, resource efficiency gains by not only um, maybe changing one small part of our operations, but by really changing the whole mindset and the model of the company. So that's just to start with, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this more as we go along. Yeah, but I'm also very interested in the economic aspect because our experience is, of course, that if you can't make the economic case to the SMEs, um, then it become, it gets very, very difficult. So you always have to show, of course, as you've already said, that there is a business case uh, involved and that they will earn money at the end of the day from their activities. Um, thank you, Bettina. Um, Katarina, um, you're a material expert um, on material research. Um, I worked in this area as well when I was at Cambridge. So I'm very, very interested in what you have to say uh, today. Um, innovation for you, is it this narrow term, material innovation, getting new materials, or do you also have a broader term uh, um, or a broader understanding of what innovation actually means? Yes, thank you, Martin, and thank you very much for having me. Um, and I think I would I would go with um, um, what what Bettina was saying. So I also have a, like a broader understanding of the term innovation, and I think this means uh, something could be materials, it could be technologies and products that have a strong impact on on us, on our daily life, on the society. And um, and I think so. Um, coming from the material science field. I re I've realized that it's usually an interconnection of small discoveries, and uh, and I think we gain the most innovations if we combine the understanding from the material science and engineering uh, to to gain more knowledge and and the the real innovation here. So it's I think it's a lot of small steps that we have to sum up to to find the innovation, and um, I think that uh, as many things in life. The innovation needs some kind of motivation, and uh, so if we if we think back um, when we we had big innovations, then usually there was something going on in in the environment in our society, uh, like some crises. And right now, I think we are also facing some challenges that probably will help us to to get to new innovations that will somehow change our our daily life again. Thank you, Katarina. Um... Lakshmi, um, without further ado, what does innovation mean for you? Yeah, thanks, Martin, and lovely to be here today. Um, I think, you know, I, I echo what Bettina and Katrina also just spoke about. It's about solutions that are not just incremental tweaks to the status quo, but really transformational shifts. So when you say transformational shifts, how do you how do you bring the entire system together? So it's not really at the product level or the technology level. There are a lot of enablers at the system level that need to come together to really um, enhance or scale these innovations. Um, and that's 
really the core of the work that we support as well at the foundation. So really looking at these cross industry collaborations, um, pulling together across the chain, uh, really to leverage what everyone brings in right from the manufacturing SMEs, but also the brands and take that right back to the innovators, so to speak. Uh, to be able to take their technologies out and make them viable business cases. Um, so yeah, that's that's what it would mean for me. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this insight. So I see a lot of similarities already. So um, innovation is not just you know getting a new material or the the newest technology, but it's a much broader definition also in terms of what it actually means for people and their, their, their daily life and so on. So thank you very much for sharing this with me. Now let's go a little bit more into detail about the topic of today's session. Um, and uh, the first uh, area we would like to focus on is, the, is materials. Um, the uh, material sector is a very important driver for innovations in the area of resource efficiency. So we have a lot of new materials every year um, coming on the market, um, but a lot of time these materials are not really sustainable because they maybe solve one problem in one particular sector but um, cause different problems along the supply chains for example if you have a new innovative material you can uh, have challenges in terms of recycling this new material uh, you don't produce enough of this material for this recycling industry uh, to to make it profitable to really process it so you always have to look at the entire um, life cycle, that's one of our experiences, if you really want to have new sustainable materials. Um, fo focus is here on the term sustainable. So I like to start off this round in asking you, Katarina, first coming from the basic, from the research side, um, what are the new sustainable materials and what are the challenging uh, uh, challenges facing in developing them and bringing them on the market? Um, well, um, so um, in, in the field of sustainable materials, uh, you can um, you can start um, looking into um, bio-based materials. Uh, so seeking for materials that originates not from um, uh, from fossil resources, but but that are renewable. That is one huge topic in the in the development of materials right now. So you will find a lot of fundamental and applied oriented work in this field. Um, and, and another thing is to not, not only to, to look at the start of the materials, so what are the resources, but also to look uh, to the end of the materials, the end of life, and uh, how we can, we can recycle the materials. And here there are uh, different interesting, uh, there is research going on that is really interesting in terms of um, based on so-called materials like vitimias. So, um, uh, so usually if you have materials that are um, uh, mechanically strong, and for uh, for the structural application that that you you have to go with uh, polymer networks that are very strongly interconnected. And uh, if you have stable materials, then you have the problem that they are very stable, and and you have uh, a problem, and it's more complicated to to recycle them. So there are um, different um, approaches how to modify um, the the chemical setup to design materials that have a uh, cross-linking in, in the polymer network uh, that that is dynamic, somehow dynamic, so that you can still plasticize them and recycle them more easily or reprocess them or repair them more easily. And um, that is now uh, now a new, let's say, quite a new community is, is built up with researchers uh, in Europe and, and also in other countries doing research in this field, uh, so designing dynamic polymer networks that enable uh, the materials to, to be reprocessed, repaired and recycled. And, and this is a very interesting topic, but it's also very challenging because, uh, as you can imagine, uh, so all the end users and uh, the manufacturers, they uh, are used to work with the conventional materials. They know exactly how to, to manufacture, let's say, epoxy-based materials and, and so on. And now you have this new class of materials and this brings you new challenges, how to handle them. And not only uh, during the production, but also at the end of life, uh, they have the special properties, but our systems are very used to the conventional materials. So, so here we have to, uh, to do more research or still a lot of research uh, to, um, yeah, to gain insight 
into the the whole process uh, and the whole value chain of the materials. And uh, so it's the the starting point and it's the end point. And, and during the application of the materials, here it's it will be still important to to get to know how the materials behave during the application. Uh, and this means um, the fatigue behavior and and aging properties of the materials. It's still still not completely understood. So very interesting new systems and we still have a lot of work to do to um, yet get an idea, a whole idea about the materials and to be able to convince the producers and the end users to, to get these materials into the market. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I just remember one example, which are the carbon fiber based polymers. Um, which uh, have been used, uh, for example, in Germany to build electric cars uh, to become very light. Um, but now, as they come enter more and more the markets, we see that we don't really have a good recycling infrastructure for these materials. And uh, that makes it, it really difficult to, to um, uh, you know, sell cars and, and, and get, this, get this material into the market. So if you don't think about the whole life cycle, then exactly. this can mean that, that a material you have developed with a lot of costs, with a lot of investment, um, doesn't really fly. So it is very, very important from the beginning also to look at these aspects. Let me go to Lakshmi. Um, um, as I understand, you work at the Lord's Foundation also with, uh, with textiles. So my question to you is, what is, in your view, the new, what are the hot new sustainable materials on the market um, from your point of view? Lakshmi. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that there is one or two, you know, promising sustainable materials. I think there's been a lot of work and research that's going on. So, for example, partners such as Fashion for Good and Canopy, who we support, um, have been actually looking at the sort of next gen innovation circular materials in this space. Um, and there's definitely more work to be done in terms of research. So, for example, what we're doing in collaboration with um, with both of these um, um, partners and with other brands as well is um, Lattice Foundation has kicked off an agriculture waste research in South Asia and Southeast Asia, where we're looking at one, the performance quality itself of the technologies and the innovations but very much um, looking also at what sort of logistics need to, to be put in place. Is there enough agricultural feedstock um, that is not otherwise used? You know, we wouldn't want to start up a new system where, where it's competing with what it's already used for. What are some of the unintended consequences, perhaps in the environmental risk front? Uh, making sure that all of that is looked at as well, because, um, especially considering that we're talking about building back better. I think, um, you know, the, the situation the last couple of months have only really helped the industry realize that uh, supply chains are, um, you know, really prone to shocks, harsh shocks, and the resiliency of such uh, supply chains lie in knowing where you're sourcing your material. So if you're looking at agricultural waste, or if you're looking at textile to textile waste or food waste, um, you know, there are many, many innovations there, such as Nanolose or Evernew or RenewCell, et cetera. But where are they getting their feedstock from? How are they getting that? Um, how can you then perhaps build out SMEs and not always put together new plants? There's, again, when we talk about resource efficiencies, it's also about building back or refurbishing existing plants there so what can be done um, near farm uh, what will be what will perhaps allow opportunities of greener jobs when you start looking at waste now um, with these technologies coming in i think one thing we're seeing is that waste is now being seen as value as as resource so is there potential to really create higher value jobs when the waste itself which is the feedstock is perhaps uh, better. So, so these are some of the things that we're looking at and very much keeping in mind that at the end of the day, again, the system needs to change around it. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at how these R&D cells of the brands who are also doing their independent research can plug in with universities who are helping us on the study, can plug in with the innovators and be able to take these innovations to scale. Uh, so, yeah, so there's, I think we're seeing that law, you know, that the waste to textile space is really opening up and also opening up opportunities for industrial symbiosis, which obviously leads to resource efficiencies um, and somewhere down the line also process efficiencies at the manufacturing stages as well. 
thank you, thank you, Lakshmi, for this very interesting approach. I see Bettina is uh, raising her hand, but before before I get the um, uh, the, the floor to you, Bettina, I would like to ask Louis. Uh, coming, you're working very close with with startups um, and you develop startups. So, um, do you have any new promising sustainable material you can present for us today? <laughs> from we the startup sector good. some secrets <laughs> we have lots of good stuff for you Martin. uh i think the, the points by uh Katerina and Lakshmi really they, they highlight the importance of of on the one hand looking at innovations in materials and technology but also making sure that these don't move too far ahead of what society can cope with or adapt to and so that gap between the, the potential of innovation, but that gap between the potential of innovation and, and sort of realistic application of that, that technology is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. And, and it is something which we're noticing that is very present when you start talking about uh, bottom-up solutions. And uh, we, we know... So Luis has frozen, I think. Um... I will I, gi I will give him the floor when he is uh, when he is back with us. Somehow he has uh, he has uh, is, is out of the conversation right now. I hope he comes back immediately. So I would uh, like to give the floor to Bettina. Um, oh yeah, here here you are again, Louis. Sorry, uh, you you were frozen for for a few seconds. So um, I give I the floor what, to you again. I don't know what happened. I'm fighting with my computer here. Uh, too much innovation in the computer business. And I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I, I, I give a few examples of how maybe from a bottom-up perspective, I'll talk especially about things like uh, resource recovery from the very basic and then move a little bit higher up towards uh, circular economy models. And in terms of resource recovery, we're seeing just take something as basic as what each one of us produces, waste from the human body. So we have an example in Kenya where uh, Dagoretti latrines they, they use biodigesters and they use uh, the uh, uh, technological innovations to actually transform this into energy, which is then used for cooking. And this becomes a substitute for what otherwise would be very polluting uh, uh, electricity generating technology. Another one is if you think of the bananas you eat every day and the plantains you have if you're from Latin America or, or Africa, once you harvest them, the stems are wasted, right? But you have in Kenya, Ico seed, they actually use the stems, which are supposed to then become waste, to extract the fiber from it and to make very high quality products, which they then target middle class uh, 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 people in society and also tourists to sell them this, this product. This replaces a lot of uh, material that otherwise would have had to be extracted from nature and, and reducing the regenerative capacity uh, uh, of, of, of nature or, or affecting the biodiversity. They don't only do this, the slurry that comes out of this, they give it back to farmers so that they can use it as manure to increase productivity. In the process, of course, because we're dealing with micro uh, enterprises or eco-inclusive enterprises, they're offering lots of job opportunities, but they're also training farmers. So you see a situation where in Kenya, Farmers that are working with Ico seed have seen their yields increase by about 18% per year. And in the process, they're also reducing CO2 emissions. Another one here, looking at the circular economy approach, which is what we're all very familiar with these days, circular economy and, and technological innovation. We have in Thailand uh, a, a, a wonderful company called Fang Thai. And uh, everybody knows that there's a lot of rice production in Southeast Asia. and uh, they, Typically, what after you extract the rice, the, the straw gets to waste. So what they're doing is they've come with very innovative approaches of converting this into high quality biodegradable material that replaces packaging. Packaging is a very sort of a, a major issue right now. It's not only that this is biodegradable and is replacing a lot of packaging. They're very selective in who they deal with. So they only work with businesses that otherwise support this kind of uh, that uh, that share this kind of values that they have so that they make sure the entire supply chain is getting greener and 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 greener and they're not only doing this to sell to tourists they're offering things like notebooks calendars uh, uh, souvenirs to people uh, and 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 so on but we also have in the case of plastics being another hot potato issue right now we have uh, echo plastire which is in uganda they're taking, they work with young women and uh, 
uh, I was going to say children, but that would be quite terrible. This is another case of child labor. Just they work with, with young women. And what they do is they collect uh, uh, waste plastic and they convert it into echo poles. This is what is used in construction fencing, uh, as well as in uh, as substitutes for floor tiles. So in, in, in this sense, they're keeping the plastics in circulation for as long as possible. But they also do something very interesting. One of the things that they offer to people that are selling this plastic waste to them is what is called a waste medical insurance. These are, uh, uh, typically, this kind of people that are selling plastic waste do not get insurance, and so they're providing additional services. You see a situation where you have technolo uh, technological innovation and also social innovation to go along with it. And one more thing to add about the uh, Ecoplastyle is that as the uh, lockdown started or the COVID pandemic, uh, started becoming uh, affecting a lot of um, uh, society. They actually decided and set themselves a target of providing at least one million masks to people that are supplying them with plastic waste to make sure that they're not heavily affected by this and that they can continue to generate income. So these are typical situations of bottom-up innovation, introduction of, uh, of uh, uh, material that is already available in society, and looking at how uh, societal adaptation mechanisms can best optimize this towards well-being. Oh, it's very interesting, and I, I like your um, examples how this actually also helps the local communities. So, um, thank you very much, and uh, we will talk afterwards. I see some very interesting investment opportunities. <laughs> thank you, Lewis. Um, Bettina, you wanted to add something. Yes, thanks, Martin. Just um, quickly, and just really echoing also what um, all of the other um, panelists have said, but. Um, I really liked also what you said in the beginning in terms of we have to look at the whole life cycle and we have to consider also what could be the potential trade-offs um, to avoid burden shifting, which is something that we also really um, try to do with our work. And um, I just wanted to mention that also when we talk about materials, we should not again forget the system around it, because I think it's very human of us to hope that we'll find the sustainable material that we can then use and continue producing as much as we want to and consuming as much as we want to. But if we talk about a more sustainable consumption production system and a more um, circular system, um, then we should also think about um, sort of how can we use um, materials longer, how can we reuse them, and how can we already reduce material input from the sign-on. And I just wanted to mention that um, we have done some research together with the Life Cycle Initiative, taking exactly this life cycle scientific approach um, for certain single-use products in the plastic sector. And what we found is that alternatives that are not single use always perform better from an environmental holistic perspective. So it does not really matter which material, but what matters is that we use them longer. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know, for instance, the example of um, the tote bags that are very popular now um, instead of plastic bags getting for shopping, which is really good because um, they, they can be used for a longer time, but then it's also up to us to actually use them a long time because unless we use them for a certain number of times then the environmental impact would still um, be bigger from the life cycle perspective so just to also keep that in mind that it's not only about the materials but also how we use them Bettina let me just uh, uh, stay with you for a moment and go to the to the next question um, you've already talked about the life cycle and um, you said that um, uh, you gave this example and, and we already know um, that's something we always have in Germany, this magic number that 80% of the resource efficiency of a product is already decided in the design phase. Um, uh, as well as, of course, then it, it also has an impact on the manufacturing uh, of these products. So my question to you is, um, as, as UNEP, you probably um, have a good overview of projects worldwide going on. So, so maybe you can give us some examples or your view on how design and manufacturing can actually decrease the use of materials and how this can help to become more resource efficient. Yes, sure. Um, so we have quite a few examples on this. Um, I also invite anybody who is listening. Um, we have a platform called the UNEP Circularity Platform, and we're collecting sort of examples um, of companies also that we work with, um, or also policies in that space um, on that website. But um, one that comes to mind is, for instance, um, we are also working uh, in the textile sector. And um, we have um, found a company in 
in um, in Brazil, and um, which we featured as a case study on some work that we've done on product lifetime extension. And I find their approach quite interesting because so they are a fashion brand and they are using um, sort of the fabric scraps um, that um, you get from production to make um, patchwork clothes. And for them, it's really very much embedded into the brand identity and also into the design um, and therefore also reduces waste, of course, is more resource efficient and um, is really um, built into the whole business model from the beginning, from the design on. And um, what's also um, interesting about this this example is that um, they have a sort of a second stream where they educate their consumers about how they can use longer their clothes and how they can reuse them. So for instance, they offer certain workshops where you can say, well, I have this dress that I really like, but somehow it doesn't quite fit anymore. I don't know. I'm not such a fan. And let's turn it into a different product. Let's turn it maybe into a skirt or let's turn it into a handbag. And then they actually do this together with the consumers, which then also gives the sort of um, emotional connectivity. Um, if we stay with the textile example, and I think that comes back from something that also um, one of my common um, panelists has mentioned before, um, it's super important to think from the design stage on because design will tell us what we can do later on with the product. So for instance, if we think about chemicals, the sort of chemicals that we use in the product will tell us um, whether it is actually then healthy to and possible to recycle the product at end of life or um, we can design products in a way that they are modular. If we think about, um, I don't know, printers or mobile phones, I'm sure a lot of us have had the experience of, um, well, there's only a little part that I would have to change, but now I have to get an entirely new product because it's just not possible. Um, so if from the design, the, the, uh, the it is more modular and it allows for parts to be replaced, then that will also uh, throughout the whole consumption cycle of the product um, decrease the, the resource use and help us to use products for a longer time. Thank you. I'm now going to Katarina and I will then call on Joanna to give to give her view. Katarina, um, you, you work at Fraunhofer and I know that Fraunhofer always has the obligation to also show that the developments or the, the work you do is relevant for industry. So you're probably very um, competent to tell us a little bit more about how can materials, innovative um, uh, uh, design um, and, and, and also manufacturing uh, innovations uh, can help to reduce materials and how you, when you also design your materials, you already look at probably also savings in the in the manufacturing phase. So um, how does this play a role in your daily work and how what are your experiences here? Well, so it's a, it's a very important um, question how to um, not only to, to design the material and to start with the chemistry, but also to think about the manufacturing uh, step and um, uh, and the, especially right now as, as we think a lot about circular economy the design for recycling uh, plays a really um, huge and important role right now and uh, as we are also very um, uh, experienced in the adhesion, ad adhesive technology and joining technology uh, this is exactly the point where where we are also very active thinking about the bonding on demand concepts um, this would help a lot to, to separate components um, in, in the first place and then thinking about the materials that we use for the single components um, and this could be uh, like the, the polymers and, and re reinforcing fibers, fillers. Um, then we also have to think about concepts how we could, uh, could think about the manufacturing and also the separation in the end. And, um, the, the, the first example that I've mentioned before about the dynamic polymer systems uh, that would give us the possibility to, to reshape or reprocess them, uh, although they are already uh, finally cured and, and usually this type of materials are not reshapable and reworkable uh, anymore, but, but this type of materials would also um, um, uh, utilize and, um, and simplify the manufacturing. Um, so, so we, we would be able then to reduce the energy that we need for, for the manufacturing that we usually need for, for the conventional types of materials. There we need uh, like um, molds that, that we have to, uh, to equip with the materials. We usually need uh, longer times until the whole uh, chemistry and polymerization process is finished. 
and with novel materials that um, uh, with shorter curing times and and so on we we can um, yes make the the manufacturing process uh, processes more uh, efficient in terms of energy time um, and also material consumption um, so 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 here the material science uh, can help a lot to also influence the manufacturing of uh, of the materials, and and actually you have, you have the like the two parameters: the material itself. So you can use uh, the molecular design to uh, to decrease uh, polymerization times, polymerization temperatures, and and you can also optimize the process itself, um, um, special molds and and so on that that you could could improve for. Um, for yes, um, for energy efficiency and and material efficiency. Uh, so I think we um, so we have we have different possibilities to 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 have an impact on on this. Um, and yes, and one very interesting field is also the the debonding on demands to think about adhesives that are also kind of smart smart materials that respond to to different to environment or to stimuli that that you can. Um, used to trigger something like debonding, and that would uh, would help a lot to yes to to design the the uh, the components in a different way, and um, and and this is something that Bettina mentioned, like this modular approach, that uh, that is something that is also very much interesting for us. Thank you, Katarina. Um, if you want to know. Uh, little bit of self-advertisement. If you want to learn more about um, best practice examples from companies, how they use design and manufacturing um, innovations to reduce the material use, you can also go to our YouTube um, channel. Um, and this uh, there you will find uh, movies we made in companies um, with all across German, uh, the German industry with different examples how to how to reduce uh, material use and we've done it with 10 to 15 uh, minute long movies and um, um, this channel is quite uh, popular so you're very and then these movies are also available in English and uh, you can look at it if you are interested in what's going on here in Germany with a lot of very um, ap applicable examples. So I'm going to Joanna now. Um, Joanna, I, what caught my eye in, in, in the description of your work was the supply chain approach. Um, we've talked about a little bit about life cycle now and um, uh, you, you or in this, in this short description, I read that you use supply chain uh, as a tool for development. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on this? What, what, what do you exactly mean by this and, and give us some examples? I think this is another example how to use life cycle approaches or supply chain approaches um, to, to increase the sustainability of companies and to help companies um, uh, uh, in, the, in the developing world. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's a really important question. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to go off on a tangent first. Um, we have a, we have a we have a little echo chamber here. I think in, if there's a danger. I think we're all talking a little bit about this idea of systemic innovation. I just want to quickly pick up on that because these are really cool questions in terms of sustainable materials and innovation and design and manufacturing, and that's really cool. But like none of this is relevant when the fundamental system is not sustainable. And I think that's a really important thing. We have a system where like very strongly governed by our financial system, which requires growth because of the way that interest payments are required from debt, for example. So when the fundamental goals and the rules that govern this system are requiring unsustainable behavior, we have a massive challenge. And so what I see now is the short-term goals, the, the, the goals of the system are around short-term profit, and that can be five years, and that's still short term when we're thinking about the context of materials and the lifetimes of materials that we're using um, and infrastructure that, we, that we're building to process those materials. And what we really, really need is a more holistic set of goals. And what I love from some of the um, examples we're hearing is this idea of um, addressing social challenges. So we talked about employment. So how do we generate the most possible employment so that most people can have um, meaningful livelihoods so we don't have this system whereby there's profit for a few and then kind of the less the rest are left to kind of scrabble around with with whatever's left um so i think that's one fundamental thing that i really want to um pick up on and 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 that context is so critical 
So it's not just about what is the sustainable material or the sustainable process. It's around like, what do we have in front of us right now? Um, and so, for example, if we have a young labor force, that's an amazing resource um, that we need to use. Um, and if we say something, you know, we've got lots of multinationals saying we're going to have X percent recyclability or 100 percent recyclability of our products by whatever date. And that's really nice. But you're probably selling your products all around the world. Your supply chains are reaching kind of the deepest corners of, um, you know, informal communities of low income communities. Are they able to process your materials? So recyclable where in what context? Um, so I think that's a really important thing. And on, on the kind of you know we talked about the the informal sector a little bit and, and how they are using materials and generating livelihoods from that and i think this is where we where we have this massive potential because these supply chains that we have reach to the deepest corners like you will find a bottle of coca-cola in the most remote village in africa on the highest peak in peru you'll find those coca-cola bottles um, and so the distribution channels and the value chains are engaging everyone and everyone's feeling their impacts um, so your so my my little um, rant on that side. Um, your main question was around how is this being done in supply chains and where we work um, in in many African countries. Um, the reality is a lot of African communities they don't necessarily distinguish between this is your business, this is my business. They they connect together and the partnerships that they create together are interdependent. And so unless we are seeing these interdependent partnerships, so. Um, let me think of, um, so there's an interesting example in um, in Uganda where there's a massive challenge um, with hyacinths, water hyacinths, which are creating pollution. Um, and so um, there was also, you know, we have this massive challenge around packaging um, where these materials are being brought into countries that have no processing capability or not in an effective way. Um, so there's an entrepreneur who has set up an organization called Higher Bioplastic, and they are using a lot of the things that Katerina would understand much, much better than me um, around um, creating bioplastics. Um, and they are working with communities um, to make sure that they are engaging them and creating livelihood opportunities for those communities. Um, and then they're working with higher up the value chain to make sure that there is um, room for those products to be accepted and those products are being tested. So I think that's that's one massive opportunity area where communities can be engaged. Um, one area that I think is really important um, as an example is speaking about palm oil. Um, palm oil has got really, really bad press and for very good reason, but also palm oil can be incredibly sustainable. Um, there's lots of capacity to um, use all of the byproducts from palm oil to, um, to power the, the processes for palm oil and to regenerate soils. Um, and there's also huge opportunities to engage communities um, because um, it's usually communities who are um, who are operating palm oil plantations um, to ship palm oil to far flung places and to fraction it and refine it to all sorts of different odd things that you can no longer um, recover is not sustainable. But palm oil as a kind of refined as a refined oil can actually be very healthy for cooking. So depending on how you're using something and the context in which you're engaging your supply chain answers your question. So for all of the questions that we're going to talk about today, the answer is it depends. And it, the, the answer is how it depends on context. So sorry, I tried to cram lots of different things in there and I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, but feel free to ask me to elaborate on any area. Uh, thank you, John. It was already very interesting and we see what innovation means it's really not just focus on the scientific uh, progress or on the technological progress. What we need is also to look at the societal implications and, and come from there. Um, as you might know, or you don't know, but it might be very interesting to you is that in Germany, we right now have a um, very broad discussion about probably a supply chain, uh, supply chain logis uh, legislation, meaning that um, uh, uh, companies were required by law to meet certain social environmental standards, especially OEMs, uh, to make sure that their supply chains um, are, are safe with regard to social standards. That's primarily what, what is discussed, but also to environmental standards. And you already see that this, uh, this discussion is very controversial in Germany and that uh, um, uh, but the government, as is, is, is I can observe, is uh, very um, determined to do something about it in terms also of legislations for OEMs in Germany to improve uh, these standards. So it's uh, just something, I think, just one example to watch uh, in, in the framework of this discussion. 
Um, thank you, Joanna. I, I now want to move to the next uh, field of our discussion today, which is digitalization. Now, the question is a little bit, how can digital technologies help SMEs become resource efficient with minimal investment? And I think the most important thing is here, minimal investment. Of course, um, we have, for example, done a lot of work in industry 4.0, um, where you put sensors all over the place, where you um, have uh, business intelligence systems which can measure the material flow in your whole company, which can identify um, points where material gets lost, um, um, which uh, gives feeds real data into a, a, an online system which then can optimize the production process. Um, but of course, this is um, this is uh, requires a lot of investment. I mean, just one company which which won the um, environmental prize in, in, in Germany this year, uh, our biggest prize in the area of environmental progress. This company um, is a is a role model for using digital technologies to become more material and energy efficient. It it actually produces um, um, bins, a metal um, metallic. Um, bins uh, and so so it's very basic but the technology they use it's it's pretty impressive but it's also of, of course requires a lot of investment we talk about 35 million euros um, of investment here uh, just for one small company and of course that is not an option for a lot of smes um, in germany but i also think across the globe um, but we've also found examples where just using an app a very simple technological application uh, can can decrease uh, the material use and the energy use by about 25%. So I would like to discuss a little bit with you the um, the question how digital technologies can help SMEs to become resource efficient. And I want to start off with uh, Luis again. Um, uh, I always come back to your experience with with starts uh, with startups and. Um, uh, do you have examples for us how with very minimal, very low investment um, uh, and uh, in, in the area of digital applications or digital technologies, companies can actually uh, become more sustainable? All right, uh, thank you so much. I, um, I, I would try to broaden this at the beginning just a little bit to give an example of how small and medium-sized companies are, are filling the gap where government is failing to create uh, adaptation mechanisms for the communities. A typical one is in Latin America, and, and in this case, the company is called uh, Amazonico, which is in Colombia. And what they've done is due to sort of either the absence or very weak waste collection mechanisms, it's then become in the uh, in the hands of private of uh, private citizens and companies to organize this kind of collection. And what they've done is create an app, Amazonico has created, uh, created an app that co that collect, uh, connects um, households that generate waste, of course, to recycling facilities that are there that can make uh, financial gains out of this. And this app sort of gets access to support the middleman. It links an online platform with an offline platform and that once you sign on, you get a toolkit. This toolkit explains to you about a little bit about recycling, understanding the, the labels, and uh, waste separation processes and it offers lots of incentives for people to keep participating in this scheme and this is a, a, one of a typical example of how an understanding of the role technology or innovation can play can translate into very practical uh, solutions on the ground another one uh, that i um, I'm going to go back to Thailand from, from Colombia. I, I, I love Thailand for one thing, but also we have quite a good number of uh, examples coming from there. I also love rice, if, if you're wondering. Um, we, we have a, one of the enterprises that we've supported and worked with over the years. It's called Listen Field, and it's created what is called a, a farm AI. It's pretty much a platform that collects lots of data. It combines climate data, soil information, data on a wide uh, rise varieties and more than 100,000 observation points. And it provides this to farmers to optimize, uh, to help them optimize productivity, to understand conditions under which they can grow uh, better and increase their yield and to optimize their, product, uh, their productivity. And, and what, this is, uh, what it also does is uses this platform to help them to sell some of those uh, uh, products that, that, that come out of there. At the same time, the data that it's collecting, they don't only use it for profit-making purposes, 
they share it with the government to help government to come up with better sort of frameworks or regulations or, or, or create better environments around which consumption of more sustainable products can, can, can be practiced. And it's not necessarily the case that uh, developing such an app is cheap, but the investment in this compared to the value in society is quite substantial. Uh, the, the, the difference is quite, quite substantial, especially if you consider that it delivers about uh, 40 to 60 percent reduction in CO2 emissions com compared to more trans, uh, to more conventional uh, farming practices. It reduces the amount of chemicals that uh, get into uh, agriculture, and it also helps uh, uh, farmers re uh, increase yield by more than. Uh, I would say more than 50% of farmers that have participated here have seen very substantial increases in yield. This combination of using the technology not in itself, not to satisfy itself or just the market, but to, to, to meet a societal need and to help better regulatory, uh, better regulation of, of uh, the, the environment in which people are operating, businesses are operating, and where government needs better policy is a very typical example of how technology, the benefits of technology and innovation can go way beyond the amount of investments, very minimal investments that, that go into it. Thank you, Luis. Um, before I go to Bettina, um, I would like to invite uh, our audience also to, you can submit questions um, via the chat box and we would like to hear from you. Maybe you have questions to our audience. Um, you would like them to answer or small uh, or little contributions to the discussion, and, and I would like you to invite you to use the chat box to to um, also interact with us. And um, Bettina, from the point of view of UNEP, um, again, you have probably a good oversight about digitalization. If we talk about digitalization, I probably um, you have to look at both sides, right? You have to look at the uh, potential of digitalization. Um, how can digitalization contribute um, for SMEs, for example, to come, become more resource efficient, but also look at the environmental costs of digitalization in terms of raw material use, um, in terms of energy use. Um, so my question to you is, um, what is your experience? Um, how is digitalization catching on? Uh, what is your view on using these technologies, uh, especially for SMEs, to become more sustainable? But also, how is UNEP addressing the environmental questions regarding the challenges which come with digitalization? Okay, um, I could speak for a long time on this, but I'll try to keep it short. That's a big question. Um, I think just to the last part um, that you said, the sort of um, environmental footprint that's left um, through um, the, the cooling of devices, etc., cetera, um, just through the data, um, it's as usual important that we just take a holistic perspective. So um, I think we have to compare the sort of savings that we can make by using digital solutions to um, the additional footprint um, in terms of, for instance, climate that digital solutions might create. So it's always um, important to have that balanced view. Then, of course, it does become a bit challenging because we cannot tell a small startup and um, please do a life cycle assessment of all of this. Um, but there are certain tools um, and we are also providing um, certain um, tools and capacity building on this. And there are shortcuts you can take that, for instance, you don't do a proper life cycle assessment, but you go by proxies, you go by hotspots analysis. You kind of try to also learn from what others have already analyzed in the space to have an indication of where it makes sense to go to. And I think also coming back to what you said in the very beginning of the session, um, if we talk about SMEs, we also have to speak about the business case because, of course, um, they, they might um, integrate sustainability, hopefully at the heart of the business, but then they also have to survive economically. So um, I think their digital um, tools can provide a really good incentive. Um, we had a recent discussion together with the African Development Bank um, around the fashion sector in Africa, and there we had a few designers from different African countries. And there, I think they are far ahead of um, some um, European countries, for instance, in terms of how to use digital tools, and it's really in the making 
speaking and they were also saying that it really helped them through COVID to still, um, for instance, um, keep their design up um, to instead of models then um, do sort of the, the fitting of the clothes uh, with digital tools online. And um, I think what's also important and it builds up on something that Lewis was saying is also to not forget um, sort of um, how can we communicate through that and how can we use, for instance, apps to reach the consumer, um, how can we use digital tools um, such as blockchain to uh, look at the supply chain, the value chain, and to look at uh, the transparency and traceability because a lot of uh, what we're saying here in terms of taking the holistic view and making the biggest savings where they can be made also depends on how do we know where actually our materials and our products come from? Um, does the company know what is the, the second, third tier of my suppliers? And um, what actually, what is the condition in the factories where my products are being produced? And all of this information is really hard to, um, to keep track of. So here, I think we also can think about digital solutions and um, using that more and more for sort of real-time data in the future. I hope Thank you very helpful. much question <laughs> thank you very much um i want to now go to the to the next question i, I mean digital utilization is, is is of course a main driver another one is um the collaboration between research and industry and um, i want to go to lakshmi and ask you a little bit more about your experience first um what is the relevance for you uh, with regard to really um, collaborating working together uh, with uh, collaboration between research and industry and as well as cross-border um, uh, cooperation. Um, do you have uh, an insight or a view or some example for us how um, your line of work mm -hmm. this, this contributes and helps SMEs to become more sustainable? Yeah, sure, Martin. So I think there's this multiple levels to this. So um, like I said earlier as well, you know, taking that technology out of the lab, but actually practically applying it um, and rolling that across the supply chain is the need of the hour. And oftentimes what we see is that the innovators are working behind sort of closed doors and R&D cells. But then when it comes to quality, performance, you know, those sort of aspects, which actually in the textile space make a big difference, because at the end of the day, it's also how, you know, what that material is used for at the end of, um, at the end user stage as well, there needs to be a lot of cross collaborative research that happens there. So for example, uh, one of the, one of the projects uh, or the initiatives that we're supporting involves, um, you know, Fashion for Good, who did really the, the research, the in-depth due diligence and technical research of the materials, uh, specifically on alternatives to wood-based cellulosics and, you know, so, so more renewable forms of uh, this. And they looked at textile to textile waste and chemical recycling of that. Um, they highlighted about five um, innovators, but then at the end of the day, the brands needed to test the quality of the end garments as well. And another piece of that puzzle is also the industrial manufacturer uh, and the SMEs that lie in between as well. The ones who will take that sort of pulp or whatever that technology is from the innovators, spin it into yarn and produce the, the clothes. And so this is, this is an initiative that we funded to really test out the entire piece. And that's going to be, that's what's ongoing now. And another layer to that, that will be looked at um, is how do you collect, how do you, you know, how do you collect back those uh, pieces of clothing, either from the post-consumer stage or the pre-consumer stage? How do you do that efficiently? So can you perhaps bring together a cluster of SMEs, not just a factory by factory approach, but, uh, you know, of, there's, there's mostly textile clusters across the world, but how can you look at uh, bringing together, uh, defining certain standard operating procedures, looking at how do you segregate that waste even in terms of color and material and things like that, because the technologies really need all of that defined as well. So you can't really just go in and put in a blend of materials and say, okay, let's just pull out the fabric. So it really requires a lot of uh, sort of logistics and thinking that goes into it. So that's where we're, you know, one of the one of the examples that I can give you. The other one is, um, you know, uh, we've we've uh, sort of supported some universities and again doing this with with brand collaborations. So for example, Wageningen University is helping us on the agriculture waste study. Um, well, they come in from that hardcore technical perspective, but at the end of the day, 
Um, there's also that piece of the brands who need to come in and test those technologies because there's the consumer uh, aspect of it, there's the sustainability aspect of it, um, there's also quality and the performance aspect of it. So that's another place that we really see cross-industry collaboration and uh, you know we, we do support projects like that. Um, and I think what's important is there's a lot of these happening at the pilot stages. Uh, so it's really nice to test out you know, a particular type of uh, uh, food waste or, you know, a banana or hemp or, you know, things like that. But what is it really going to take when we look at that global footprint and tying out those supply chains? How do you actually do that? There's so much food waste uh, in, you know, but how do you actually ship that to where the manufacturing hubs are? Does it actually make sense at the end of the day? I think that requires not only uh, you know, technology innovators to come together or just the supply chain, but it would require a larger system. And that's where policy interventions, we, you know, we, we work a lot on seeing how uh, perhaps subsidies in supporting mills and, you know, uh, in establishing that is in place and really catalyzing private sector investment. So I think, um, you know, uh, there's, there's one aspect of donors going in there and playing that catalytic role, uh, but private investment and public uh, policy intervention must follow as well to really see these shifts happen at scale. So uh, that's where I think, you know, a large part of the work that we do sort of rests uh, in this cross-sector, cross-industrial thing. And another one, just as an example that I think everyone can look out for is, um, you know, like HK Rita, which is a Hong Kong research institute for Textiles, so they do a lot of work again in terms of identifying um, materials, but working together with SMEs and others in the supply chain as well to take that to market and make the investment case ultimately. Um, I just want to briefly turn to Katarina before I get on in, in this in this context. I mean, Fraunhofer is working closely with with industry. Um, um, sometimes you have demands from industry for certain materials. Sometimes you offer your materials to the industry. Um, how how well works the argument of sustainability? Is some is that something companies really um, have on their agenda, or is an item when they when they give you an order asking you to develop a certain material? Um, of course, cost is probably the 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 top uh, functionality, and cost is probably the top. Uh, um, uh, point, but is sustainability, um, life cycle assessment, are these things also um, 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 aspects where um, companies in, in ask for, do you see a development in this? Is it more and more or is it, does it become less? What is your view on your experience? Well, so my experience is really that it's, um, it's increasing the interest and uh, I think it's mainly due to the to the society and the interest of the society to change something and um so and and you are right it's always about the costs so so we have um uh first projects related to um to materials that are more sustainable that are bio-based or biodegradable um and and the, the industry partners are seeking for my, for altern alternatives to the now conventional systems that are non biodegradable and, and non bio based and and then we have uh, the challenge of uh, trying to find like a midway between the costs and and uh, the gain and and usually the the most important argument is um so it's it's it would be um okay to have a, a higher cost for the material if um if we then are um uh, are able to to have to create a bio-based product that we can also promote as a bio-based product that will gain a higher visibility and 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 the consumers they are uh, they are begging for uh, for novel materials and trying to be more sustainable and this is like the motivation of the industry they they have realized that the society is now. Uh, is now really prone to to this type of materials and uh, so there's there is a market developing and and there is now the motivation also for 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 different industry sectors to to think about alternatives in the material design and um, yes but it's very challenging to uh, to 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 get uh, like the right material um, without uh, without increasing the cost so. Yes, but I would I would like to to add something also to the 
to the two other questions, the digitalization and how this can can help to um, to reduce the material needs and to help the small companies. Um, so, so there is also something that we can do on on the material side uh, to, to get it more sustainable and uh, and useful for also for small companies without having them um, too high investment. And right now there there are different national and international projects related to this. Um, thinking of uh, centralization of material data, uh, because as as Bettina said. Uh, small companies they they cannot afford doing life cycle analysis and so on so this is uh, like a showstopper for them um, and if we can then think of something like um, material databases that are available for companies and and we in, in the fundamental research like at the universities institutions and also in the industry we we have a lot of material data that that we generate throughout the projects so there is already material data available and, and we, we develop more and more. And if we find a way to, to generate a, like a platform uh, or in, in the European project, they call it marketplaces, uh, then, then that, this would be a possibility for, for others to, to get access to, to data without having high investment costs for, for special tools. So it would be like uh, like a shop where you can shop data that that you right now need for a special uh, question that that you that you address. And uh, so so this is something that my colleague Kai Brune is, is dealing with, uh, doing uh, lots of projects in this field. And I hope that he will give us a, a short link in the chat where you can get more information to to this kind of projects and how this could help uh, small and and also bigger companies uh, to. Yes, to, to somehow um, get help with the digitalization and um, material data that is available and that is not necessary to be created on all the single places again and again. Thank you very much. I want to go briefly now. I see you, Bettina. Um, but I, I will have, we will have a final round where you can make your points. But I now just want to turn to some of the questions uh, we received because we don't have much time left. Um, and I just throw the question at you, and uh, you, you want to show your hand um, if you want to answer it. The first question is from Mark Darris. What about structural materials, uh, steel cement uh, for construction and mechanical devices? So um, do we have uh, that topic, structural materials, materials for the building industry. Um, is there somebody who would like to, to talk a little bit about what, what can be done there in terms of material innovations and construction? Joanna? I can talk a little bit about it, maybe from the SME perspective, again, similar to Lewis. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful enough if others want to um, to, to come in there. Um, so we've seen quite a few. Um, so as a bit of background, we've been doing this piece of research into circular economy case studies from across the African continent. Um, and so we've been trying to identify um, what's going on and what we can learn from them, what they can learn from each other and what the rest of the world can learn from what's going on. Because I think at the moment, a lot is being dominated by European and American kind of dialogues and, and high tech, high digital technology um, activities. And there's some really amazing grassroots and even um, larger scale initiatives happening there. Some of the things we're seeing in construction, a lot around um, plastics using waste plastics. Um, and I think there's still um, some viability to be proven in some of those areas, particularly around paving blocks. So um, there's an organization called um, Arena in um, Tanzania who is currently, and they similarly are working in partnership to, um, to try and research and prove their model and the, the formula they've developed and the, the strength and capacity of those blocks that will be even stronger than the existing materials on the market. Um, there's also an organization called Pyramid Recycling in Ghana run by an amazing grassroots entrepreneur who um, is incredibly passionate about reducing deforestation and he wants and also the plastic waste challenge that he sees and so he wants to create um plastic wood effectively which um from the initial tests he's been doing are um you know as strong and durable and even have better um performance with grass just um banging nails into the into the materials um so um so there's some really interesting innovations happening there um i think everyone's probably seen some of the innovations that are happening around um roads and using waste plastic for road construction um, and the possibility for that to be used. I think there are some challenge around um, nanoplastics getting in and microplastics getting into the environment with some of those areas. I think a lot of these um, innovations, um, material innovations, 
still there needs to be um, additional testing with regards to the kind of longer term impact. Um, and there's an organization in South Africa which is using waste materials um, and construction waste and returning that back into construction materials um, because construction is one of the most wasteful um, sectors. Um, so I think those are the main ones in construction I can think of. Thank you very much. Um, another question is, I mean, I've, I've already given one example, which is our center, but can you give the example of government intervention to support SMEs on resource efficiency? Are you, are you in, 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 I think it's not just, um, you know, um, throwing money at them, but also to give them a legal framework where can where can they can uh, be more resource efficiency. Are there any example from your experiences? Bettina, you, I, I think you, you raise your hands, is that correct? Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so just it's a question from Dina Sismaraini, sorry, please. <laughs> Hi Dina, and thanks for the question. So just very shortly, but um, I mean, I mentioned in the beginning that we are working with SMEs on what we call eco-innovation, and the way that we've worked was always, we work directly with the SME to help them to mainstream sustainability in their business model and work with partners, but also at the same time, we work with the governments in those countries to put the enabling conditions in place because otherwise it's going to be very hard um, for the SME to flourish in that space. And just some um, examples that come to mind is, for instance, um, the government could put um, public procurement um, criteria into place that favor um, buying products from SMEs that have um, put certain resource efficiency measures into place so that then creates a market and a demand for them. Um, they could also put, for instance, certain eco labels um, so that and give um, preferential or um, no rates to certain SMEs so that they can get certified with a label and therefore then approach to the consumers and again create more of a market. Um, and then there is, of course, um, capacity building, um, which is something that, um, I mean, we do in our projects, but um, it is great if the governments um, do that and they have centers in their countries who always um, um, offer this sort of education and um, education on the latest technologies and on innovations that are possible in the space. Um, so, yeah, just a few ideas there. <laughs> What I also very like, much like, is the um, Unidio initiative on the sustainable production centers, which basically also are an, an, an good example for capacity building uh, around the world. Um, and the next question yeah, is from Carlton. Sorry, Sorry Bettina. Martin, just to say that uh, this is actually it's a joint UNEP Unido initiative, and this is how we apply eco innovation through those centers, <laughs> which are very much like um, the center you're working in. So, yeah. I know, and it, it's a really great initiative. And of course, it's it's initiative from both UNEP and UNIDO. Thank you. Carlton Pitter, Pickering is asking finance data collection technology are the major problem for farmers on my island, Anguilla. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Can you speak to this issue? Um, finance data, the, the collection of finance. Uh, data and, and collection and technology. Is there is there a view on that or experiences? Lewis, do you have some some advice to give or um, some some how um, you you collect uh, finance data uh, and and uh, technology applications for farmers? Um, uh, uh, do you have any uh, insight on that or anybody else? Uh, Yes, a few examples I can give. I already mentioned uh, the the example of uh, uh, listen fill uh, in in Thailand, but an, an, another one here you can look at is uh, farmer line in Ghana, and uh, what they do pretty. Much yeah, he has no pause. Uh, print the pause button, I think. Um, okay, is there a, is there any? But tech, it's always technology is is a, is an interesting challenge these times. Um, Lakshmi, you like, want yeah, to say something? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we do, so we work, you know, we support um, farmers in sustainable cotton farming, especially organic cotton farming. Um, and one of the tools that we use to collect this data um, to also track progress is something called Source Trace. Um, which is a tool that's used on the field. Um, and a large part of the work that we do is also enabling the farmer collectives or the farmer producer institutions to be able to also learn how to use these tools. And I think this is something that we've seen digital tools really coming into the picture with farmers um, during the COVID uh, you know, uh, lockdown time. Uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of use of this as well. So this is a tool that that collects it and then analyzes it, and we also can use for, um, you know, it, it's a traceability tool, but also something that 
you can do your M&E with um, on programs as well. Thank you, Luis. You were interrupted, so applause yours again for a brief brief response. Uh, I was going to give uh, another example of what uh, PharmaLine is doing in, in Ghana, and they have a platform called uh, uh, Merck Data. And what, what they pretty much do with this is collect lots of information which they distribute uh, to, to, to farmers. But they, they're also adopting it in what it's probably, it doesn't sound like the most innovative aspect, but they're still using what, uh, using SMS and voicemail to distribute to farmers. Because of course, typically these people do not have uh, uh, just very smartphones and, and, and fancy equipment which they, 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 they can process with. And what you find is this engagement between them and the farmers is in itself generating uh, a, a lot of data on how the farmers are producing on the economic conditions that are uh, the, the, the economic viability of their practices. It's the same thing you find with what uh, farm, farm AI is doing in Thailand as well as what uh, um, a few of the other examples that I've given are, uh, are doing with their, their apps. Thank you, Luis. There are a few other questions, um, but uh, due to the time, we only have four minutes left. Um, I would like to suggest that these questions can be also answered in the chats or afterwards by, by our panel speakers, so they are all stored. And um, I would like to ask the DGKP then to um, maybe put these questions to the um, panelists and maybe we can answer them um, afterwards as well. There's just one question which we probably can um, answer quite uh, briefly. Bettina, again, the question was what's the uh, specific name of the UNEP Unity initiative we just talked about, the, the sentence. Maybe you want to repeat. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe to the... say that they are independent now, <laughs> but uh, okay. we are part of a network which is called the Resource Efficient and Cleaner Production Network. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, I just want to wrap up now in three minutes with just another round um, on uh, on the panelists, um, just with, with asking you just for a brief answer, um, what is the major um, uh, conclusion you take away from this um, from this panel today? Are there any things you learned today and are there any um, ideas you, you take up for your work? Um, let's start with the other way around. So from uh, alphabetically, um, uh, uh, from from the other side. So Lakshmi, uh, you're first. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think you know it, it's been really good to just hear again from all panelists that it is the systems lens and the holistic sort of approach that one needs to take to to look at innovations in in any space really and. Uh, you know, cross industry, and I think it's uh, it's good to hear the tools that all of you are using, right from the policy level to the you know on ground SME level, and uh, would be very interesting to see how this can then be applied across uh, the value chain as well. Thank you, Lakshmi. Katarina. Uh, well, it was really inspiring, and um, it reminds me of to to keep in mind during material design. Uh, the whole value chain again and uh, designing uh, very fancy materials means that we have to think about where they will be used and uh, what this will mean for the materials and and what we were thinking when we were planning them so thank you very much for this Bettina um, likewise it was really nice to to have the echo and feedback on this yeah let's take the systemic view but I think I also learned a lot actually from what Katarina was saying the more really detailed granular this is what you have to think about when you develop the materials and uh, this is what we take into account so that was great to see and um, I also um, really liked the examples that were shared by the other panelists um, and this is something that we also love to do to just share between the regions what's working in one country might work in another and um, we are also we're starting a new project on eco innovation and sustainable business in Africa now and um, perhaps there's going to be more room for collaboration and on there thanks that would that would be great if that would be one of the um, results from today Joanna uh, I eat so much and really different um, perspectives um, or, or angles for me um, I'm always nervous about buzzwords but I hadn't actually heard the term eco-inclusion before. I hope it doesn't go down the, I mean, the word sustainability doesn't mean anything anymore to me. Circular economy is going the same direction. But I think, you know, we talk a lot about um, regenerative and inclusive development, and it's something that we're really obsessed with. 
Um, and so the word eco-inclusion is, e yeah, eco-inclusive is really nice. It makes sense to me. I'm not sure how it will land with others. So I'm intrigued for other people. You know, is that something that was intuitive to you? Because it's a, it's a nice term to use, but we have to, we can't leave people behind. You know, it's, it, we have a moral imperative not to. Um, and so the development we, we do must be inclusive and, and the most marginalized are suffering the most from the problems in our system. So we just have to be inclusive and, and we have to protect this planet that we're on. So that's from me. Thank you for this very important input and, and the great work you're doing, Joanna. And uh, yeah, last but definitely not least, Lewis. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Joanna, I feel like you should join SEED. Uh, it, it would be fantastic to, to work together. Um, we started this, this uh, webinar was about uh, building back better or rebuilding better. And I think one of the things that I've actually taken here is um, the distinction between uh, product innovation and system-wide innovation. Uh, what one of the lessons COVID-19 has taught us is that it's not just a lack of medicines and so on, it's health systems that are unable to support us in difficult times. It's provisioning systems that are unable to meet our needs when we're locked down. It's uh, community support systems that are unable to allow us to give comfort to each other uh, in times of need. And I, I think drawing from this, it doesn't matter how much material innovation or product innovation that is out there, if it is not human-centered, and if it's not catering to people from the bottom up, it is completely irrelevant in a context where there's so much need and so much want, and the drive for sustainability is so urgent. So thank you for that. On that note, thank you very much to all of you for this very interesting um, discussion, for these very important insights. Um, me coming from, you know, the uh, engineering side to learn uh, really a, a lot more about the side societal implications it's always very important that we look at these aspects as well so thank you very much to together to paint a very um, holistic picture of the challenges in this area and um, thank you very much for to all of you for contributing uh, to this very interesting session and i wish you all now a very good day a very good week stay healthy and thank you very much goodbye